Center for Tourette Syndrome and Associated Disorders. Its directors and employees assume no responsibility for the accuracy, completeness, objectivity, or usefulness of the information presented. We do not endorse any recommendation or opinion made by any member or physician, nor do we advocate for any treatment. You are responsible for your own medical decisions. Now I'm going to turn over the introduction of our speaker to Martha Butterfield, the webinar coordinator of NJCTS. Marty? Thanks, Kelly, and good evening, everyone. I'm pleased to introduce you to Dr. Colleen Daly Martinez, tonight's presenter. Dr. Martinez is a real Jersey girl, born and raised here receiving her undergrad, MSW, and PhD from Rutgers University. This is the second webinar she's done for us. Her previous one in, in August of 2015 was a discussion on anxiety and test taking. If you have an interest in that topic, I encourage you to download her webinar at no cost from our website. Dr. Martinez is a licensed clinical social worker and a registered play therapy supervisor with more than 20 years experience providing clinical services to children and families. She has worked in a wide range of institutional environments including medical, correctional, outpatient mental health, public schools and private practice with a specialty in play therapy and children. In her private practice, Dr. Martinez provides supervision and consultation to individuals and agencies, particularly regarding interventions with children. She provides school-based play therapy to preschoolers in Irvington, New Jersey, and is also a part-time lecturer in the MSW program at Rutgers. Dr. Martinez, we are delighted to have you back. And now, without further introduction, I'll turn tonight's presentation over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you folks for attending tonight and thank you Marty and New Jersey Center for Tourette Syndrome and Associated Disorders for inviting me to speak with you tonight. And thank you especially to Kelly for her expert technical consultation. I appreciate it so much. Um, so one of the first things that I want to talk to you folks is about um, some of the language that I'm going to use tonight. So I am a mental health professional. I refer to myself as working in mental health, but some folks use the term behavioral health. Uh, we're pretty much referring to the same thing when we're talking about mental health or behavioral health. When we're talking about interventions, we're talking about psychotherapy. So um, again, my primary verbiage will be behavioral health, but basically I'm referring to emotional, psychological behavior, and sometimes even developmental concerns and, and interventions that we can use for those. So when I explain to kids what I'm doing with them, I explain that I'm someone that can help them with their problems and worries. There are a number of different professions that might do similar work to me as a social worker and a registered play therapy supervisor, including psychologists, professional counselors, school counselors, marriage and family therapists, and psychiatrists. I happen to be a social worker by training. So as Marty was saying before, I've used play therapy in outpatient behavioral health programs. I've also used it in private practice settings. And now I use play therapy in a school setting. As many of you may know, in schools when children need special services, they often, re um, they often receive individualized education plans. And on individualized education plans, students might be eligible for speech therapy, physical therapy, and occupational therapy. Well, I work in a district that is being very progressive in helping their students with emotional and behavioral problems, and they're also offering play therapy as part of a school's, uh, ind a child's individualized education plan. So I also teach master level social work students about play therapy so that they can be more effective therapists with their future clients. Other play therapists work in multidisciplinary clinics, hospital settings, and even in home settings. Play therapy in some forms can be used uh, with people of all ages. So you might even see play therapy happening at rehabilitation centers and even nursing homes. My overall goal for tonight's webinar is to share information with you uh, so that you can learn a little bit about play therapy and so that you could know how to find a play therapist if you wanted to. 
I'll not be able to give you professional advice specific to any child. If you do decide to pursue any behavioral health services, including play therapy, I strongly encourage you to talk in detail with the provider about your hopes and your expectations of therapy, as I can only speak for myself and the clinical interventions that I provide. Um, so this evening, I want to give you a, a good overview of some of the differences between traditional talk therapy and play therapy going to give you a little bit of history of play therapy, talk to you a bit about theoretical frameworks, of course talk about the effectiveness of play therapy, and then we'll talk about how you might be able to find a play therapist if you were interested. At the end of our time together, we will have time for questions, and I'm happy to address those. And again, if we don't have enough time, I will also respond on the blog. Um, but first, before I proceed, I'd like to get a little bit of a better understanding of why you chose to attend tonight's webinar. Um, I would imagine that you might have concerns about how your child or your children are doing emotionally or behaviorally. Um, so I'm just going to ask Kelly if she could help do a quick poll to get a sense of where you're coming from and what you're looking for tonight. Uh, so to get a better understanding of why you've attended today, and so I can hopefully anticipate some of your questions and concerns that I might address in my presentation, um, I'm going to expect that most of you are parents, um, but I also understand that you may be attending because of your concerns, maybe for a child that you work with. So I'm going to ask you to answer a couple of qu quick questions that Kelly's going to share with you. And um, Kelly, is is it up now? It is up for the um, okay. for the attendees, Great. and they are answering. I'm, I'll give Great. it another. Um, I'll give it until we we have more than fifty percent who have voted. How's Great. that? So my first question is, how old is the, um, I'd ask you to think specifically about the child that um, most concerns you. Um, how old is the child? So what I have up currently is what is your biggest concern about the child? So Okay, what is your biggest concern about the child? Okay, I'm going to close the poll and I'm going to be closing the poll. Great. And I should be able to share it. And of course I hit the wrong button. <laughs> To share it. I oh, gotta love it. Here we go, share. Here are our results. Um, and 68% of the people voted. And would you like me to launch immediately? I wonder if I can see the results. Huh? Can you receive? Oh, I'm sorry that you're not seeing them. 32% um, are non aggressive acting okay. out. Okay. 53% um, are aggressive acting out. 26% are relationship difficulties. Uh -huh. 37 are about worry, anxiety, and sadness. And 16% are um, about experience of loss. Okay. Okay. And what about the age distribution of kids? Okay. I will launch that now. Thank you. Oh, one of these days I'll hit the right button. <laughs> okay, I have launched How Old is the Child? And I'll give it um, 45 seconds to, for people to respond. So, um, Generally speaking, who, ta who takes up your play therapy? Um, who takes you up on play therapy? Is it really young children um, or um, people in middle school, people in... So that's a good question. Really, um, as, as potential clients uh, get younger, the more... I am to recommend play therapy. And just so you folks know, and also for you, uh, Marty and Kelly, play therapy isn't the only modality of treatment that I provide as a psychotherapist. There are lots of different disciplines that I'm trained in, and I 
choose play therapy based on what my clients need. And um, the younger the child is, the uh, less verbal the child is, um, the more likely I am to either provide play therapy or recommend a therapist. Okay. However, one of the things that, you, that everyone should know is that there are some play therapy techniques that are great to use with people of all ages, even, even adults. Okay. Um, I will share, I'm sharing with the audience the, um, what uh, the poll reads, thank you, the results. Um, so um, nobody, nobody is looking for birth to two-year-olds. 19% um, are looking for the three and four-year-olds. 52% okay. are concerned with the five through 10-year-olds and 29% for 11 and older. Okay, that's very helpful for me to get a sense of, of who we're talking about. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Uh, so there are lots of different reasons why people might be considering services for their child. Um, and that those could include, again, um, non-aggressive acting out like lying, disrespectful behavior, aggressive acting out, hitting, breaking things, uh, losses, traumas. Um, other reasons might include social problems, challenges between siblings, and even challenges between parent and child. Um, one question that comes up a lot is, how do I decide whether or not my child needs to see a professional about these concerns? And here are some things that I would encourage you to think about in deciding if it might be the right time to consider asking a professional for help. Um, so do you have concerns about how your child's doing socially, emotionally, or behaviorally? Uh, has anyone tried to address these concerns? And if anyone has tried to address the concerns, has it been successful at all? Another question might be, have you discussed your concerns with the child's pediatrician? And what does the pediatrician think? Do you feel comfortable and confident in your ability to influence your child's behavior in a positive way? Are you worried about your child's adjustment to a recent experience or event? Are you concerned that something that happened recently might negatively affect them in the future? These are the kinds of things that might help you figure out uh, if you're leaning one way or the other. Um, so now let's talk a little bit about uh, the difference between traditional talk therapy and play therapy. So if you do decide that you want to pursue services or psychotherapy for your child, the next step to consider might be what kind of psychotherapy to look for. In a little while, I'm going to share with you some specifics about play therapy, um, but first I'd like to give you some more questions to think about in deciding what you might want to pri if you might want to prioritize finding a play therapist versus a regular talk therapist. So, as I was saying before, some things that I think about are how old is the child? How verbal is the child? Are they reluctant to talk about their problems or worries or about what happened? Uh, these really help me to figure out who might best meet a child's needs. For example, I got a phone call today from somebody who was looking for services for a two and a half year old who had experienced a pretty significant trauma already in his short life. There are, are not many traditional talk therapists that I think would um, have a great grasp of how to treat a two and a half year old. So for this client, I strongly suggested that they prioritize looking for a play therapist. Sometimes I get calls, people are looking for services for a 10-year-old or an 11-year-old. And so then I start to wonder um, how verbal is the child? How willing is he or she to go to therapy? Do they want to talk about these problems or is it just too hard? Those are the kinds of things that you might want to think about. Traditional talk therapy does require a certain degree of verbal ability and also willingness and ability to talk about issues and stressors. So again, the younger a child is, um, traditional Typically, the less able they are to be verbal, the more likely I am to recommend play therapy. Um, but as I said before, there are some play therapy techniques that I use with every single client that I work with, whether they're five years old or 50 years old or um, 75 years old. So now I'm going to talk to you a little bit more specifically about play therapy. Uh, why do we think, um, those of us who believe in play therapy, why do we think that it's the right modality for children, the right type of intervention for children. 
Well, play is really how children communicate. We've all seen children interacting with toys, interacting with peers, interacting with the environment. And we have seen, I'm sure, children communicating their experiences and communicating their wants and desires through play. Play is universal. All children, regardless of their access to materials, engage in play behaviors. If they developmentally and physically are capable, children will engage in play. And of course, children learn through play. If we can remember watching our infants and toddlers picking up blocks and eventually learning how to put one block down and another block on top of it. Uh, they were learning something in that process and we were seeing it happen. It wasn't because we were teaching them how to stack blocks, it's because they were playing and the learning became part of, the, the learning was part of the play. Of course, play is how children develop. That play motivates them, interacting with materials in a sensory and physical way motivates them to, to grow and to develop. Of course, play is usually fun and stress-free. And one of the things that we know about psychotherapy is that when we're talking about problems and worries or challenging things that have happened to us, it can be quite stressful. But when we incorporate play into the psychotherapy, it can make therapy much more palatable. It can make it much more comfortable for the child. Um, I should tell you a couple of things. Um, well, let me tell you a little bit more about what play therapy is from the Association for Play Therapy's um, perspective. So the Association for Play Therapy is a national organization of play therapists, and um, they defined play therapy for us. I'm going to read you their definition and then I'm going to translate it into plain language. So play therapy, according to the Association for Play Therapy, is the systematic use of a theoretical model to establish an interpersonal process wherein trained play therapists use the therapeutic powers of play to help clients prevent or resolve psychosocial difficulties and achieve optimal growth and development. So that's big wordy definition. Um, in plain language, what the Association for Play Therapy is telling us is that play therapy is used by people who have training. Their purpose is to develop a therapeutic relationship so that they can use play within the therapeutic relationship to prevent or resolve problems. So what is play therapy not? Um, some of the things that I've heard um, are that people are concerned that play therapy is too easy to actually be helpful. Um, another thing I've heard is that play therapy seems like too much fun, so the child couldn't actually be learning or changing. Um, some people say play therapy is too childish to work with older kids or adolescents or even adults. And I can tell you from my many years of experience that play therapy is absolutely not um, too easy. Uh, it does make the process more palatable and more manageable for some. Another thing um, that I should tell you is play therapy is not simply watching a child play, and it's not simply a child playing. The only way that play therapy can happen is in the context of a clinical relationship, that means a professional mental health relationship with somebody who has training and knows how to use the powers of play. So who is play therapy good for? Obviously children, but also adolescents who are resistant to traditional talk, talk therapy, people who have been traumatized, and people who have difficulty expressing themselves through language. Now, I don't know about you folks, but I sometimes have a hard time expressing myself through verbal language. And uh, so in some, in some cases, play therapy can be useful for anybody. But particularly, we think about it in use for, with children and adolescents. Um, play therapy has been used with many different populations for many different presenting issues.
So you've probably not heard of play therapy before, and you're wondering if it's a brand new thing. Um, and I am going to give you some surprising information. Um, play therapy is not new at all. In fact, Sigmund Freud used play in his treatment of children. His idea was to let them play out their issues. Um, his daughter, Anna Freud, in the 1920s, was the first to suggest that children should receive play therapy versus traditional talk therapy. So this is not by any means a new type of intervention. As I told you before, we have the Association for Play Therapy, which is a national organization, and um, sorry, they're an international organization, and they were established in 1982, and they started establishing play therapist credentials in 1992. So play therapy has been around for a long time. And as I'll talk to you about later, there's also a lot of research about it and its effectiveness. So this isn't a classroom, and I don't want to give you uh, too much textbook information, but I do want you to know that there are theories of play therapy. And the reason why I want you to know that is that not all play therapists are the same. In fact, if you meet 50 different play therapists, they'll probably do 50 different types of play therapy. Um, and there are a lot of things that we look to to decide as play therapists, what am I going to do with my clients? One of the things that we look to is the evidence, the research. What do we know is effective in treating people with these presenting issues? The other thing that we as play therapists look to are theories. And theories are basically some people's ideas about why problems are there and what are possible solutions to these problems. And of course, we never know if a theory is correct. We can't prove that a theory is accurate, but we can do research to help us understand if theory seems to make sense. And uh, believe it or not, I think there's more than um, 30 different theories of play therapy, possibly even more. There are many different theories. We're not going to go over all of them tonight, but I just want to give you an, a sampling of a few theories so that you can start to understand that all play therapists are different and they, they take their knowledge and their information from different places and, um, and what some of these theories might be that inform their practice. So child-centered play therapy is the first I'd like to talk to you about tonight. And child-centered play therapy is based on the belief that people have an innate ability to heal themselves and to grow. And so in the context of a child-centered play therapy relationship, the play therapist engages with the child in a completely accepting relationship, and the child decides everything. The sessions are completely child-directed, and that doesn't mean that the play therapist is sitting back and checking her emails or texting or, or going to do something in the other room. The play therapist is very actively engaged in the child's play, and the idea is that through this child-centered relationship, the child can start to master their own issues, and they can start to make changes within themselves. And uh, one of the things that I noted on the slide here is that child-centered play therapy is an evidence-based practice, and that's important um, terminology for you to be aware of. So we as mental health professionals are mandated to use evidence-based practices. We need to do interventions that we know are effective. Just like when you go to the emergency room because your leg is swollen and it hurts a whole lot and you can't stand on it, you want the evaluating doctors to do an x-ray and to do the assessment that is indicated by research and to provide you with the best treatment for your diagnosis, that's what you should also expect of mental health professionals. And so mental health professionals don't just do whatever they want, they need to look to the evidence to see what is effective. And child-centered play therapy is one of the most well-researched types of play therapy. So you can be assured that if somebody is doing child-centered play therapy, that they have looked to the research and that they um, have chosen it because there's a lot of research that says child-centered play therapy is effective for a wide range of presenting issues and problems. So another theory of play therapy is cognitive behavioral play therapy. 
And, and this is based on cognitive behavioral theory, which is something that you may have heard before. And the idea behind cognitive behavioral play therapy is that there are connections between the way that we think and the way that we feel and the way that we behave. And sometimes our thoughts and our feelings and our behaviors are healthy and functional. And sometimes our thoughts and our feelings and our behaviors can be dysfunctional or problematic. And so sometimes when children have behavior problems or emotional problems, it may be rooted in some distorted or some incorrect thinking. And so the cognitive behavioral play therapist uses play as a way to engage the child and help the child feel comfortable in therapy. The cognitive behavioral play therapist also uses play to teach skills and to challenge distorted ideas um, and to and one of the goals is to make changes to those distorted or incorrect ideas and to improve behaviors. This is also an evidence-based practice, meaning there's research that tells us it's effective. Now cognitive behavioral therapy is one of the most um, the most dependable sources, uh, the most dependable um, types of intervention in psychotherapy. There's a lot of research that says that CBT is a very good practice in, in intervention. Cognitive behavioral play therapy is based on CBT, and that's how it is an evidence-based practice. We know that CBT works, so using play within CBT is also going to work. Um, so this is probably one that you're less familiar with or probably never heard of before, and it's called prescriptive play therapy. This is the theory that I most ascribe to myself. And the idea behind prescriptive play therapy is that there's no one theory that answers all of our questions or problems. There's no one intervention that's the right thing to do for every child with this issue. And so prescriptive play therapy says that play therapists should know a lot of the research and they should know a lot of theories, and they should know a lot of different interventions, and they should pick and choose their interventions based on the individual client and their issues and the research on the effectiveness of interventions. And so this um, model of play therapy works very well in outpatient settings where we want to achieve realistic short-term goals. Insurance companies like us to plan short-term treatment and um, so prescriptive play therapy uh, might look like a play therapist is, is using lots of different theories in their practice. So just so you're getting the idea, all play therapists certainly are not the same, and there are many different things that can influence those variations, including training, including personality, including the type of theory that they ascribe to. Um, and again, play therapy is useful with lots of different folks, particularly children. So one of the things that I would like to share with you now is, um, is some materials so that you can get a sense of what play therapy might look like. Uh, play therapists always, regardless of their setting, play therapists always use materials in their work. And what I mean by materials is equipment and supplies. Uh, it play therapy requires, requires us to not depend so much on verbal language. And so we use other kinds of materials to help clients ex express. I'm going to show you some photos of materials. Now, I'm going to show you a wide range. Some play therapists that you might come across are going to have fully equipped playrooms. And others will just have toys in a more traditional office setting. And other play therapists will actually use traveling playrooms or carry toys with them to various locations. So I just want to give you a sense of the kinds of things that you might see and explain to you why play therapists might be using them. So this is, as you, as you can see for yourself, a dollhouse. One of the things that's different about this dollhouse versus one that you might see in a school setting or even in your own home setting is that you'll notice that the furniture and the people are not placed in the dollhouse. And the idea behind this is that when a child comes into a play therapy setting, 
we don't want to tell the child what their world should be like or what their, their world should look like. We want in play therapy to give children an opportunity to express their own experiences and for them to tell us what their world is like. And so you might see something like this where the child has an opportunity to, to place the furniture, place the people to demonstrate to us what's going on in their lives and, um, and how they're feeling inside. So when play therapists are building their collections of materials, they're thinking about toys as potential for words. Because remember, play is the language of the child. Children express themselves and their lives and their experiences and their worries through play. And so toys become potential words. And so when I choose things like a baby doll or a doctor's kit, I'm giving kids if they need an opportunity to talk about or to express about or to process about nurturance or neglect or pain or fear or control. These are things that a child might be able to express with these toys. So some play therapists will have dress up and costume materials. And the idea behind that is that I want to give the child an opportunity to take on different roles. Sometimes when it's really hard to acknowledge or talk about problems, if I can take on somebody else's role and I can play it out, it's going to be less scary or intimidating for me. So sometimes in play therapy settings, you might see weapons. You see here I have a, a toy sword and toy handcuffs. When I work in a private practice setting, I have weapons and, and um, toys that might symbolize violence. And that's really something that varies a lot depending on the play therapist that you're working with. And it's something that you should talk to them about if you're, if you're thinking about meeting with them. What's their access um, or what's their perspective on access to aggression toys? So one of the reasons why I have these kinds of uh, potentially aggressive toys is because I want to communicate to kids that I work with that they can talk to me about all different kinds of things. They can show me all different kinds of things. They can show me the happy and the rainbows and the hearts, but they can also talk to me or express to me about difficult things or scary things or painful things. Now, it also depends on where I'm working. So now when I go into the public schools and I work with kids in those settings, of course I don't bring weapons because there are very serious and strong policies against having weapons of any sort in school settings. So it really varies on policies. But uh, one of the things that people wonder about is, will my child be more aggressive if they are exposed to potentially aggressive toys in play therapy? And there's a lot of research that's been done about that. And the bulk of the research says that when kids have an opportunity to be aggressive in play therapy sessions, they are not more likely to be aggressive outside of sessions. So that's important for you to be aware of. So when I worked with kids who had been traumatized, many of them had to eventually go to court. And I don't know about you, but whenever I have to go to court, I'm pretty nervous and intimidated and scared. And, um, and I'm a, an adult who's been there many times and knows what's going to happen. When kids have to go to, to court, it's even more scary for them. The only frame of reference they have for what court is like is what they see on TV. So they think that people misbehave, they think that people are dangerous there, um, they worry about all sorts of things. And so in the setting that I was working in, we would have a set like this to help kids not to talk about what they're going to testify about or the questions that they're going to be asked, but we would have toys and materials like this to give kids a chance to, to see what a courtroom might look like, to help them practice what might be the emotional experience of being in the courtroom. Interestingly, even though I worked with a lot of kids who were going to court, every kid that ever engaged with this set of toys set it up as a classroom. And that's probably not surprising to you because school is really the job of kids and that's where they spend most of their lives. And so the, the giving them people and giving them furniture and giving them toys gives them a chance to express what their issues are. And while I might think their issues are about court, they might have big issues about school. Most play therapists are going to use some degree of uh, art materials. Art 
interventions really give people a lot of opportunity to express. And when I had my own play therapy office, I had a big easel with lots of different art materials. In other settings now, my selection is much more limited. I might just have crayons. But the modality of art is really one that gives a lot of opportunity for expression. So there is a discipline within play therapy called bibliotherapy. And it's using books and stories in therapy. There's something that's so comforting and validating about reading a story about somebody who has the same problem that you do. Lots of times when kids have to go to therapy, they're embarrassed, they're ashamed. It's for a problem or a behavioral issue. They feel like they're in trouble. They feel like they're the only ones that have this problem. And there's something about reading a book about a kid who has the very same issue that really decreases their sense of shame. So some of these books are books that were specifically written for psychotherapy, and others are just written um, for, for kind of general well-being. Play therapists might have access to many different titles specific to lots of different presenting issues. Board games are something that you will very often see in play therapists' offices. And you probably recognize some of these, right? Candyland and um, maybe even Go Away Monster. Please let me reassure you that the play therapist is not just playing Candyland with the child. When play therapists use board games in therapy, there are lots of different reasons. It may, might be that they want to assess the child's ability to take turns and follow rules. It might be that they want to, um, oh, the child tolerates stress. It may be that they're using the game in a clinical way for teaching. So, for example, we might play Candyland where every time a child lands on a red piece, they have to talk about a thing that made them feel angry. Or every time they land on blue, they have to show us their happy face. So there are lots of different ways that games can be incorporated into play therapy. And generally, this format of board games is comfortable for kids. They're used to it. They, they take some comfort in the back and forth and the taking turns. And it's a way that can really make difficult therapy much more uh, manageable and uh, less anxiety producing for them. Puppets are another thing that you might see in play therapy sessions. And just like as I was talking to you about the um, costumes and dress-up materials, there's something about the distance that puppets give children. When a child puts the whale puppet on her hand, the whale is often able to talk about serious problems that the kid is unable to talk about. It gives them some distance, some protection. And um, lots of expressive stuff happens when, when kids have access to puppets. Not all play therapists use sand therapy, but some do. And um, a sand tray and miniatures may be part of a play therapist's playroom collection. So these photos were when I worked in a outpatient setting where we all had our own offices and we could build our own playrooms the way that we wanted to. But that's not always the case. <laughs> I'll also show you some examples of, um, of, of um, more typical playroom materials. Regardless of where you're working with a play therapist, you're likely to see photos and, uh, and demonstrations of how I can put my feelings into words. This is a very basic level intervention where we want to help kids eventually be able to recognize and verbalize their feelings. Oh, so this is an example of a traveling playroom. So when I use child-centered play therapy, that therapy where I believe that the child has the ability to heal themselves, and so what I need to do is provide them with a therapeutic relationship and a playroom, I need to have lots of different materials because I need the child to be able to express to me all sorts of things because I don't know what's going on for them. So this is a bag that I would carry around my child-centered play therapy materials in. And every time I saw a child, I would unpack it. So it was almost as if I had my own playroom, even though I'm traveling around to different locations. 
Sometimes, especially with um, cognitive behavioral play therapists or play therapists who do a lot of traditional talk therapy and they're just doing some play therapy, they might just have a very small selection of toys and materials that they bring out when their clients come in. So there are lots of different ways that a play therapist's setting might look, and those are just some examples and ideas. Um, so really important question here. Is play therapy effective? Will it be effective for my child? What outcomes can be expected after play therapy? So I'm going to take each of these um, questions in turn. The really good news is that there's a lot of research that tells us that play therapy is effective uh, for children with trauma issues, anxiety, adjustment problems, somatization, where children have physical symptoms associated with their emotional well-being, behavior problems children in children with learning disorders, um, oppositional defiant disorder. There is um, a growing body of research saying that play therapy is an effective modality. Now the question of will it be effective for my child really depends. Um, one of the things that I encourage you to think about if you're considering pursuing treatment with a psychotherapist or play therapist is what are your goals? What do you hope that play therapy or psychotherapy can achieve for your child? Lots of times when parents come into me, they literally have a list of 25 things that they would like to achieve um, in my work with their child. And to be honest with you, if we focus on 25 different things, we'll never get anything achieved. So one of the things that I encourage parents and families to do is to really prioritize what are the top one or two issues that are most important for us to work on right now. If we're more focused, I find that we can often be more effective. Um, really important to talk about um, expectations. What do you expect of therapy? How often will they expect you to be there? How long will therapy be? These are all uh, really important parts of the process of getting to know a play therapist and starting a relationship. We do know from the research that when parents are involved in treatment with their children, it's going to be more effective. So lots of times that's surprising. When parents call and, and are seeking services for their children, they kind of expect that they're going to drop their child off for 45 minutes and then come back at the end of the session and bring the kid back again next week. And um, lots of times play therapists are going to want you to be involved in, in the process. Sometimes it's going to be for the whole session every week. Sometimes it's going to be for a portion of the session every week. Um, rest assured that if the play therapist is um, asking you to be involved, it's not because they think you're a problem. <laughs> um, it's because they know, probably based on the research and also their clinical experience, that parent involvement in treatment benefits children tremendously and it really uh, increases the positive outcomes of play therapy. Uh, so what kinds of outcomes could be expected after play therapy? Well, it really depends on what the presenting issues were going in. And so if you bring uh, a child in who's having a lot of um, anxiety and difficulty sleeping, you would hope that after play therapy, the child would have less difficulty sleeping. The child would be less anxious. Maybe they're falling asleep um, more quickly or having less nights of restlessness. If the child is having aggressive acting out behaviors, one of the outcomes would hopefully be that the child will be less aggressive less often and that the incidence of aggression will be less intense. So while I would like to think and believe uh, that, that we are miracle workers or that we can have cures um, in mental health and behavioral health, we, we don't have magic cures and we don't have um, very quick and easy answers. Um, but play are experts in mental health and they're experts in children and they're experts in interventions that can help decrease symptoms, um, decrease problems, and increase um, social, improved social behaviors and absolutely improved relationships and communication. 
one of the things that I hope for all families that I work with is that when I say goodbye to them, their relationships between each other and with each other are going to be improved. Um, so I know that a lot of this is very kind of um, classroom and technical, and uh, I really did want to share with you some case material so you can have an idea personally of how play therapy um, works for people. Of course, because of confidentiality issues, I can't show you too much. But I do want to talk to you about a couple of kind of um, demonstrative examples so that you might start to understand uh, a little bit more concretely how play might be helpful to kids. And so the first child that I want to talk to you about um, is a four-year-old girl. And this four-year-old child had diagnosed speech delays and language delays. And she was in preschool, and she was revert, referred by her preschool team because of being really aggressive and being really bossy. So let's think about that for a minute. Do we think that traditional talk therapy is going to be a good idea for a four-year-old child with speech and language delays? In my opinion, probably not. Many talk therapists are literally not going to know what to do with a, with a four-year-old with speech delays. So I knew that I needed to use play therapy with this young child. And I decided to do what we call child-centered play therapy with her because I knew that I couldn't ask her about problems. I couldn't expect her to explain to me why she was being aggressive or bossy. And so what I did was I gave her a safe relationship in a playroom where she could express to me her issues. And uh, it was really quite a profound experience to be able to witness her healing herself. And what she basically wound up doing was playing out her own experiences through the dollhouse, through um, toy dolls, and with vehicles. She played out her own experience of a house fire and the subsequent trauma of being homeless and having lost, her lost all of her possessions and moving somewhere else. Now there's no way that I could have gotten to um, sit this kid down and have her tell me this stuff and have her explain that her trauma was causing these behavior problems. But in the context of this supportive relationship where she could just play what she needed to play, she basically, she basically showed me the trauma of her experience. And it was about fear and threat and danger and loss. And after she played this out a whole lot, I was able to understand a whole lot more about her experience. And outside of our sessions, she was much less aggressive. Over time, she was able to talk more about what happened. And outside of play therapy, her, her behavior problems and her symptoms went down. Now these are the kinds of things that happen in a school setting. And in school settings, we don't always have the opportunity to work with families. If this was in a outpatient setting where the family was also involved, I would also be checking with family and asking about her experiences and asking them to report on how her behaviors are outside of the sessions. In a school setting, we sometimes don't have that information, and we don't have that ability to work as closely, but still I was able to witness um, and also get report from school staff that her behavioral issues had really decreased tremendously over time. I'm going to give you another quick case example, and then I'm going to turn it over to some questions. Um, so I just wanted to talk to you briefly about an older child. So this boy was nine years old, and he was really verbal and insightful. And he could have came into my office and on the couch and did traditional talk therapy because he wanted to be there and he liked me. But he was also really um, drawn to art materials. And uh, while he was very cognitive and verbal, uh, he was much more expressive emotionally when he was painting. And so basically, he was referred for anger issues. And through his paintings in my office, he wound up processing his experiences of loss and grief related to the death of his grandmother. And the way that he did that was painting after painting after painting, where he painted about loss, and he painted about grief, and he painted about sadness. And so I probably um, could have gotten some of those feelings 
processed through asking questions and maybe by teaching him skills to, to handle his anger better. He really was able to do a deep processing of his issues of grief and loss through painting, which was much more comfortable for him. So again, um, these are just brief examples to give you a little bit of a demonstration of, of, of the power of play and how it might be helpful to kids. Um, I just want to quickly tell you that um, there are ways that you can find play therapists in your area. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is um, paying for services. Um, lots of times folks, when they're interested in pursuing uh, behavioral health or psychotherapy for their children, they think, okay, well, I'll just pay out of pocket because um, it's better to just do that. Um, play therapy is often something that is recommended um, for for a period of time that varies, but sometimes it could be 10 sessions, sometimes it could be um, three months, it could be even longer. And so I encourage people, if and when possible, to try and find a provider who is in their insurance network because it makes it much more manageable over the long term. Play therapy is not a quick drop in two or three session uh, intervention usually, and so you want to think over the long term. Um, certainly, if you can pay um, out of pocket, that's great. If not, it's good to cross-reference any referrals with your insurance panels. So I just want to remind you that there are credentials in play therapy, and there's the registered play therapist credential, and there's the registered play therapist supervisor credential. And those are not standalone credentials. Those are credentials that say, I'm already a licensed mental health professional, and I also have training, experience, and supervision in doing play therapy. So this person is already qualified to do mental health work, and they're getting paid because of their mental health license, for example, social work or psychology or psychiatry, but they have, on top of that, they have training, experience, and supervision in doing play therapy. So these are the folks who are most experienced. Um, and the way that you can find those folks is by looking at the Association for Play Therapies um, Find a Play Therapist directory. So if you just click on a4pt.org here or put it in a, a Google search, you'll come across the Association for Play Therapy. They have a lot of resources there for families, information about play therapy, but they also have a directory where you could find providers. Now there are three different levels of providers that you can find in their directory and you can search by um, zip code or state or even by name. Um, first, all of these folks are members of the Association for Play Therapy, so they are interested in play therapy. If somebody has an RPT, it means that they're a mental health professional who has a certain amount of experience, supervision, and training. And if somebody has an RPTS, that means that they're even more highly qualified to the point where they even supervise other play therapists. Again, I encourage you um, to look at the directory and then cross-reference these lists with your insurance companies to see if you could find people in network. Sometimes um, they are in network and sometimes they're not. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to you. I just want to say really briefly, I appreciate your time and attention. I thank you so much for being here, and uh, I wonder if you have any questions. And if not, or in the future, please feel free to check out my business um, web pages on Facebook and also on Google Blogger. So I'm going to turn it over to you guys now. All right, thank you. A lot of really great information. Thank you. And we do have some questions. So right. I'm going to start right away. In the situation now, we're talking about special needs kids, particularly the autistic population. They have limited play skills. How does this influence the success of play therapy for a child like that? Really great question. So sometimes kids are developmentally not able to play, and then that becomes our goal for intervention. So when I have a child who does not seem to be interested in interacting with toys in um, symbolic ways or in creative ways, or if they don't seem to be interested in interacting with peers or other adults, that becomes the goal of my treatment. And so very often it'll start with just basically teaching the child um, to play catch by rolling a ball back and forth, uh, teaching them the skills of interacting with toys so that others might want to interact with them more. 
So it is um, a different type of play therapy, but play can be actually quite useful in teaching kids with autism how to interact in ways that are more um, more likely to lead to social interactions and also more likely to lead to their enjoyment of social interactions. I hope that makes sense. I think it does and the listener is still on so if she wants to rephrase that, um, that's perfectly good. Um, so do therapists ever um, interface with speech language pathologists, for example, to, for language delayed kids? Absolutely. Depending on the setting, it might happen infrequently or it might happen all the time. So in outpatient private practice settings, I, see, I would see kids who are brought in by their families for whatever issues. And if it became apparent that I needed to, um, to consult with the speech language pathologist, I would do that. But uh, in a school setting where the child's kind of package of services includes play therapy and speech and OT, we're right there in the same building, so we're going to be consulting about how the child's doing. And um, it sounds to me like some of your attendees really know a lot about special services, and um, you, they might recognize that a lot of what I do as a play therapist is very similar to what speech and language therapists do, and also... Um, occupational therapists. So it's really helpful for the child when those professionals do consult with each other. And, so it's very um, brainstorming. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it can be quite helpful to have that collaboration. And um, we often can enhance what each other, um, what, what we're doing, because um, we can share information and, and, and ideas. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, when a child is using art materials, uh, does the play therapist um, ever direct what they are making? For example, why don't you draw for me your family? Mm, what a great question. <laughs> so, I, so as I um, kind of referred to before, I teach play therapy in uh, the MSW program at Rutgers University. And those are the kinds of questions that we that we talk a whole lot about. Uh, as we said earlier, there are many different theories of play therapy, and some theories say the play therapist should never direct the child. And some theories say it is okay for the therapist to direct the child. So it really depends on the play therapist's theoretical perspective, and sometimes it's very appropriate. It just depends on uh, the type of intervention, the type of play intervention that's happening. Okay. Um, if a child is traumatized and draws a picture about it, what's, uh, explain a little bit of what's involved with interpreting that drawing. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so that's somebody else that should think about taking um, some, some training in play therapy or even reading some books in play therapy. Um, but I'll try to address it in a brief response. Briefly, yeah. yeah. So, One of the, so let me ask a different question here. Yep. So is the play therapist alone the person that evaluates that and interprets it, or is there some other resource that's in that mix? So what a play therapist should do, in my experience, is to not interpret. The only way that we know what something means is if the client can tell us, or if they um, yeah, basically, we, the only way we know what artwork means is if the, um, if the client can tell us. And so, for example, a client might paint um, red, orange, yellow, green, and purple, and a big white puffy thing next to it. And as the play therapist, I'm not going to say, oh, I like your rainbow. I'm going to say, oh, thanks for making that painting. What would you like to tell me about what you made? Because what's important is the client's interpretation, not my interpretation. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I, I'm not a big believer in being able to look at people's artwork and understand what it means. I'm a believer in trying to help the client tell me what it means. Okay, so that client really has to be verbal then. Um, how, do you, to, how does it work with very, For me to feel very confident about the meaning of their painting, yes. Okay. And so... 
And so I don't make assumptions. When, when people and kids paint, I don't say, oh, yes, I can look at that and I can tell what they're saying. Um, it's, something that, it's something that I have to really question and wonder about. Okay. Um, so you have a child um, and, you know, you, they've come to play therapy and they need to begin to express themselves in a way that will help the therapist figure out the situation. You said these th sessions it could, you know, it's not a, a, a one, two, three fix. I understand right. that. But is there any sense of how far into it you would have to go with a child? Or perhaps it's all age relevant too. That's before really you begin to make see what's happening. Yeah. So that's a really good question. And, and, um, and I think that's something that's really important for families to talk to the treating therapist about. Because what parents expect and what's going to happen might be exactly the same, or they may be very different. And in my experience, I found that parents expect um, that when kids come to me, that after two sessions, they're going to expect to see change already. Um, and so it's what I explain to parents is that the first couple of sessions of me getting to know, me meeting with the child, is me getting to know the child, the child getting to know me, and us developing a relationship. And then, after that, the next couple of sessions is us coming up with, well, what are we going to do in therapy? It's called treatment planning. So I tell my families that they realistically shouldn't expect to see any kind of change um, for, for weeks or months into the process. Um, but it really depends on the play therapist. And so that's something that I would encourage families to ask the, the provider. Uh, how quickly do you think um, I can expect to see change in my child? Because I think that's going to vary by therapist. But okay. uh, I will say that, that building the relationship and getting to know each other is a necessary part of the process. And, um, and it's not that the therapist doesn't want to make change, but it's that they know that they have to really build a good relationship before that stuff's going to happen. Mm -hmm. OK. I have kind of a two-part question here having to do with OCD. Okay, so in a play therapy situation, could neurological problems such as OCD or anxiety become more obvious and thus become the focus of the treatment? And part two is, would you use play therapy to treat a, a, for a therapy for a child with OCD or would you be using CBT? Yeah, so, so really great questions. I love these questions. Um, I think the first question is really about assessment. And I will say that play therapy and play interventions are a great way to assess children. Uh, because what often happens is that there's a stack of paperwork that precedes the child. And it's all of these different opinions about what people, other people think is the problem. And, um, and it might be diagnosis, and it might be complaints about the child's behavior. Um, but allowing the child to play and engaging them in play gives the therapist uh, an opportunity to sit back and see, what do I see in the kid? What strengths do I see? What, are, what things are going well? Where is the child developmentally appropriate? What are his or her challenges? What are his symptoms? What are his issues? And so play. Um, is very helpful in trying to figure out what really is going on. Um, so I think that that's an, a, a, an important point, and that also speaks to the issue of how long does therapy take. Once I get to know the child, I then need to assess the child, and, and then we talk about planning treatment. So the other thing, the other question I think is, um, could OCD become more obvious if I'm letting the child play? And could I use play therapy to treat OCD? And, and the answer to both questions is yes. Uh, very often, um, when a child is made to sit and talk, they're going to present differently than if we allow them to engage in the world in their natural way. And mm -hmm. so often, I'm able to see symptoms because I'm giving them that freedom. And play it can be very helpful for kids with OCD. And my best guess is probably cognitive behavioral um, play therapy is, is 
would be something that I would lean toward for kids with OCD because we want to teach skills about self-soothing and we want to teach skills about paying attention to our thoughts and stopping our thoughts and uh, doing it in a playful way can be much uh, less intimidating for kids who are anxious. Do you ever use another child to play with the child is it, or is it always the child playing by themselves what or a doing great question. artwork or whatever? So, um, so some types of play therapy are used in individual and group settings. And so I'm not so brave that I do large group settings <laughs> because I work now I'm working with very young kids. So uh, so I will sometimes do groups of two or three kids together, not not more than that. Uh, but some types are, for example, um, child-centered play therapy is well researched in group settings and it is effective. Uh, but then the other part is, do I ever use other kids to help in play therapy? And absolutely. In school settings, um, when it's just one child who is referred to me for therapy, but they have social issues, um, there's a lot of progress that I can make with them in a play environment, but there's nothing like actually seeing them interact with their peers and work on the relationships with their peers. And so I will often do that uh, as well to help kids make progress. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, we've gone over a bit. I just have one more question and then okay. we'll wrap it up after this. Having to do with weapons. So the, the whole thing about the handcuffs and the sword, uh, you know, um, I mean, I'm speaking, not the question, but I'm speaking for myself. I remember my kids playing sword fighting my sons. <laughs> when they were kids. So they did that. So so if you've got a playroom situation and weapons are part of the playroom environment, um, is that something that, uh, you know, does it mean something if the child, boy or girl, is attracted to that over playing with the dollhouse, for example, or doing something else? Or are they directed to do that based on their behaviors that they're there for? I love these questions. So what I can tell you is that we never really understand the meaning of something, especially when it only happens once. So one of the things that I look for as a play therapist is patterns or themes. So does a child do something repetitively? Uh, and repetitive could be they do it five times in one session uh, or they do it once in each session over a period of a certain number of weeks. Um, so the only way I can really feel um, convinced that something is significant is if it happens a lot. Um, if a child comes into my office and sees a sword and plays with it, does that mean that they're an aggressive kid who has deep anger issues? Absolutely not. They're probably just exploring the environment. Um, but if the child um, seems to all lean toward the aggressive toys, seems to be unable to engage with toys that are not aggressive, then that might be more mm -hmm. telling. The other thing I want to say about weapons is that, as I said before, in schools, I, don't, I can't bring weapons in, so I don't. And if oh, kids right. need to process their aggression, they'll use other things as well. <laughs> so so the, kid who, the kid who plays with the, the sword in a very aggressive way, but then also picks up the blocks and uses them aggressively, and uses the cars aggressively, and also uses the people aggressively, that's going to make me more concerned about aggression. Uh -huh. And again... The research says that it's not going to make him more aggressive outside of therapy. Um, and if you've got somebody who, who is experienced in working with kids, it will likely help them to be less aggressive outside of therapy. So if the kid is beating one of those little dolls over the head with um, a tinker toy, that's one thing versus he might swish around the sword a little bit. Yeah, and, and, and if anything happens once or twice, I don't necessarily think that that's an indicator of a serious problem. Um, mm -hmm. But when it's a theme of always aggression or usually aggression, then it might feel like it's more significant. Got it. And it might be more significant. Okay, well, I think we're going to wrap it up here. Thank you very much. Really a great presentation. I'm going very to welcome. turn this back over to Kelly for a wrap-up. Thank you for joining us on our webinar on play therapy. 
there is an exit survey which we would like everyone attending to fill out. The webinar blog is open now and available for the next seven days on the NJCTS website for any additional questions that were not covered in tonight's presentation. That website is www.njcts. Org. Also, an archived recording of tonight's webinar will be posted to the site by close of business tomorrow. Our next presentation, Charter Schools, Understanding Your Child's Rights, um, will be presented by Rebecca Spar and is scheduled for June 22nd, 2016. This ends tonight's webinar. Thank you, Dr. Martinez, for your presentation, and thank you, everyone, for attending. Good night.